What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's a ton of news to go over this week. So many big reveals and uh, of course the biggest reveal of the week though was the new Ford Bronco. All new for 2021, brand new, first time the Bronco has been back in decades and it's a big deal. So uh, Ford revealed the two-door, four-door and Bronco sport versions. So first we'll talk about the real Bronco, that is uh, the two-door and four-door versions. I think it looks awesome, much better than the leaks suggested originally. And uh, so there's a ton of info to go through. I'm not going to go through as many of the details, um, but I'm going to try and hit all the major points. So first, um, you can see the doors and the roof are removable, but the two-door only comes in a hard top. Um, so that is one thing that's different than the Jeeps where you can get a two-door soft top. Uh, the four-door uh, comes with a soft top though as standard, and you can add a hard top on that one if you'd like. Different from the Wrangler though in another way is that the doors for the Bronco are smaller with frameless windows uh, so that you can store them in the back if you have the four-door version actually bring the doors with you instead of leaving them at home like you used to have to do in the Jeeps. Uh, the mirrors are also mounted on the body instead of on the doors like the Wrangler so you can still have your mirrors even if you're driving um, you know without the doors on which is cool. It's going to be available with two different engines and two different transmissions. So first is the 2.3 liter EcoBoost four-cylinder from the Ranger and also the Mustang. Uh, but it does the same output as the Ranger here with uh, 270 horsepower and 310 pound-feet of torque. This engine uh, is going to be available with either a 7-speed manual, and the 7th gear is a crawler gear, so you have 6 normal driving gears still. But it's cool to give you that crawler gear there. Um, and then also the other uh, transmission is a 10-speed automatic, which is what you're going to get in other Broncos. Um, but that engine is standard on all except the top two trims, the Wild Track and the 1st Edition. Those come standard with the 2 7 liter EcoBoost V6 and this engine is also available as an upgrade on all the other trims as well even the base model um, but that 2.7 liter V6 is only available with the 10 speed automatic you cannot get a manual with the V6 only the four cylinder Bronco speaking of trims um, there's seven trims here um, and so it starts off with base then goes the Big Bend Black Diamond Outer Banks Badlands and Wild Track um, and then there's the first edition as well and uh, so so yeah, you can check out Ford.com or pause here to see the Ford summary of what each trim gets. Like I said, tons of details to go over, so I'm kind of glossing over some of it here. Um, all Broncos get four-wheel drive as standard, uh, but there's two different systems. The regular one has uh, two modes and has a 2.71 to 1 low ratio. And then the better system gives you a 4A automatic mode um, that will actually automatically decide whether it needs to go from two-wheel drive to four-wheel drive as needed. And that one has a 3. Uh, 0.06 to 1 low ratio um, and so they all run Dana 44 locking rear diffs um, there's seven, di seven different driving modes uh, that Ford says allows the Bronco to go over any terrain that's why they're called goat modes um, and there's also trail control and trail turn assist along with 360 cameras and even uh, trail maps to help you navigate wherever you are uh, and do it very well. Um, the interior is really cool too. You get the available 12 inch Sync 4 screen just like in the new F-150. It has wireless smartphone integration, all kinds of cool features. Um, there's a device rack on the top of the dashboard there as well where you can mount phones, GoPros, whatever, just kind of screw it right in. No suction cups needed, which is nice. And there's lots of unique material choices and stuff you can see here with wood and um, really cool looking leather and you know, all kinds of different fabrics and stuff. And anyway, they're going to be start uh, starting to build these in early 2021 with delivery starting next spring. So we got you know a solid nine months or so to wait for these. Um, pricing is going to be starting at thirty thousand dollars for the base two door version and maxes out at sixty five thousand dollars for the four door first edition. And the main reason for that is the first edition combines all the luxury stuff of the Outer Banks version with all the off-road stuff of the wild track and some other stuff and so that's why generally um you know you're not going to be able to really get a bronco over 60 grand um you know in normal circumstances so that's um interesting though uh but then ford has also revealed the 2021 bronco sport and so it's an entirely different model based on the ford escape platform but it is heavily modified and the ford engineer said this is not just an escape with big tires they did a lot of changes it's about eight inches shorter than an escape actually and three inches more narrow and the wheelbase is 1.6 inches shorter so it actually is going to appear a little bit smaller but it's actually classified as a subcompact SUV because of how much they made those changes uh, to you know make it a little bit smaller but it is going to be you know still feel fairly big because it's actually four inches taller than an escape and has a slightly wider track as well 
So, um, and they also maximize the interior space. I was reading, uh, supposedly, you have slightly more interior space here in the uh, Bronco Sport than you do in an Escape, which is kind of interesting considering you're going a whole class down as far as size and stuff. Um, so that'll be interesting to kind of actually see them in person and see how much space we're working with and stuff. But um, that's cool. Uh, and also, it's decent off-road, it seems. There's a Badlands trim, which is the top trim, and that has 8.8 .8 inches of ground clearance, um, which is a tiny bit more than stuff like a Jeep uh, Cherokee or a Subaru Crosstrek, stuff like that. The base engine here for the Bronco Sport is the 1.5 liter EcoBoost three-cylinder turbo engine from the Escape, but it does slightly more power here than in the Escape. It does 181 horsepower and 190 pound-feet of torque. Um, then there's the Badlands in first edition. Um, those are the ones that get the two-liter EcoBoost four-cylinder that does 245 horsepower and 275 pound-feet of torque, which is a good amount of power because you think of other subcompact SUVs like a Hyundai Kona is one of the fastest ones in its segment with 175 horsepower. Um, you know, and uh, you have this here from Ford doing you know way more power. So this thing should move pretty well for a small little SUV. Um, and aside from the luxury subcompact SUVs, I think this actually has the most horsepower and torque. Um, but anyway, they all run eight-speed automatics and they all come standard with four-wheel drive, although the Badlands in first edition come with an advanced four by four system that uses a twin clutch torque vectoring uh, rear axle with a locking diff and stuff. They also have all the same driving modes and trail control system as the Bronco. The interior obviously isn't as impressive as the Bronco. It runs only the standard eight inch Sync 3 touchscreen that we're already used to and it has smartphone integration but it's not the wireless CarPlay and Android Auto like you get in the Bronco um, and uh, there's a few other cool features there like there has this safari style roof with a standard roof rack on all models and it's strong enough to actually support a tent and uh, you know, you can actually camp here and you know sleep on top of your Bronco Sport, which is kind of cool. Um, there's also a tailgate with a glass hatch that opens separately. And there's all kinds of other little Easter eggs, like uh, there's hidden pockets with zippers, um, which was on that leaked window sticker that I showed last week, so that turned out to be true. There's bottle openers built in, all kinds of very innovative little things. And Ford claims it is still pretty impressive off-road too, passing all their um, tests uh, that they went through here for these new Bronco models. Um, and I personally think it's going to sell like crazy because it has the boxy shape that many people miss from that old Escape. You know, so many people miss boxy SUVs, and I think this is going to kind of make a lot of those original uh, Escape owners really happy. And I think it actually looks pretty similar to a Land Rover Defender um, at half the price of a Defender, which I think also could help sell these pretty well. Speaking of pricing, though, it's going to be starting at $28,155, including destination, which is about $6,500 less than a Bronco four-door, and even a maxed-out first edition, which is already sold out, by the way, both for the regular Bronco and the Bronco Sport. Um, those first editions uh, on the Bronco Sport or topping out at only forty thousand dollars, so a huge difference from the sixty-five grand for the big Bronco, um, fully maxed out. So that's you know you can get a much nicer trim, even though the base price isn't a wild difference. You get a much nicer trim uh, here with the uh, Bronco Sports, and uh, so and they're also going to be arriving before the regular Bronco as well. So these are going to be arriving late this year. Um, so you'll be getting them you know right around you know Christmas time or something like that versus springtime um, for the regular Bronco. So that's really cool and. Um, I think they're going to sell a ton of those things. I think both uh, the Bronco and the Bronco Sport are, you know, going to be great additions of the Ford lineup, and you know, we should be seeing tons of these things in 2021. It seems like every single person online is saying they want to buy a Bronco, and honestly, I have no interest in Jeeps or off-roading or anything like that, but. Even me, I feel a little pull towards getting a Bronco. Like, I'm not going to get one. I have no use for the off-roading and all that kind of stuff. But it's just a really cool look. And I really like all the really creative things they did with the new Bronco and the Bronco Sport, for that matter. I think they're both pretty awesome. And so um, hats off to Ford for a job well done. They seem very impressive. And we should have known that Jeep wasn't going to just sit back and let Ford, uh, you know, bask in the limelight of this new Wrangler competitor. Uh, Jeep, uh, right before the Bronco reveal uh, earlier that day, decided to rain on the parade a little bit by revealing a V8 Wrangler. So this is the Wrangler Rubicon 392 concept. And while it's just a concept for now, Road and Track claims that there's multiple V8 prototypes running around Detroit right now, um, suggesting that they're actually going to build this. And it seems like it fits in there no problem, and it's something they can do. They did say they can't fit the Hellcat motor in the Jeeps uh, and the Wrangler and the Gladiator because they would have to get rid of the crash bar. It wouldn't pass, pass a safety test. 
But I think they could swing it here with the regular V8, possibly. And I hope so, because that would be a very fun way to one-up the Bronco. Because, you know, a lot of people do wish the Bronco came with a V8, or at least a manual, or a manual V8 for the Bronco. And you're not getting any of that here. And at least in the Jeep, you could get the V8, although it sounds like it'd be automatic only. Anyway, the V8 it does run in the prototype here is the 6.4 liter V8. Uh, it does 450 horsepower and 450 pound-feet of torque in this application. It's paired up with a beefed-up version of the standard 8-speed automatic. Uh, it still has much of the same off-road stuff as a regular Wrangler, and there's some Mopar parts here on this one to dress it up a little bit. Um, but they did say they swapped out. Um, it has a 410 rear axle uh, instead of the 373 you usually get on a Rubicon, um, so that's the only change there. It also has these new half doors that are kind of cool looking um, and really opens up the back seat area. It makes that a lot more airy, which is kind of cool. Um, and that could be something they also add on, considering, you know, again, Ford has the new innovation with the Bronco doors. Um, you know, maybe that's another thing that Jeep's looking into, but if nothing else, it seems like this is the push that Jeep needed to put the V8 in the Wrangler. They've had just V6s for years and they've been diversifying with the four cylinder, but this is why competition is good. They probably had no reason to put a V8 in it, but now it's like, well, what's one thing that we'll do that Ford won't do? Drop a V8 in it. And maybe Ford will come back next year and put a Mustang V8 in the Bronco from the F 150. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but this is why competition is necessary, because if you have one thing that has the whole market, you know, I mean, Jeep's been innovating, you know, plenty, but it's still this accelerates it and just everyone uh, benefits as a result. So great to see that. And some other Jeep news, uh, the 2021 Gladiator is now going to be available with the Eco Diesel they announced this week. Um, and so it's the same motor the Wrangler got last year, and I just reviewed it uh, this past winter. And I really liked it in the Wrangler. I thought it was great, and I knew that was going to be a perfect engine for the Gladiator, and I'm glad they're adding it in here. Um, and I think it'll be the best engine for the Gladiator setup. Um, and uh, it is a decent price jump, though. Uh, it's the same price jump as a Wrangler, so it requires the $2,000 automatic transmission, and then adds another $4,000 on top of that for the engine so overall it's a six grand upgrade i still think um just for the gladiator especially to have the better towing capability i think of that diesel over the v6 um it's just it's just such a punchier motor that diesel motor too i think it's definitely the best engine for the gladiator probably and i'm excited to try it out and they're going to be available this fall, and uh, it's going to be starting at about $41,000, including destination um, for the cheapest sport trim with the diesel, and of course you can get in the higher trims as well. The last little bit of FCA news, though, is kind of funny. So the new name they announced this week for FCA, because you know they're merging with Peugeot, and it's this huge merger, and so they needed a new name, and it couldn't be FCA Peugeot, I guess, so they're naming it Stellantis. Um, so... Stellantis, they say, is rooted in the Latin verb stello, meaning to brighten with stars, and that the Latin origins pay tribute to the rich history of its founding companies, while the evocation of astronomy captures the true spirit of optimism, energy, and renewal, driving this industry-changing merger. So, um, yeah, cool, but why i mean it's just no one's it has no connection to either company there's no hint like what is it it could be a drug uh that you know a new pharmaceutical thing uh Solantis. it could be you know hidden city there's all kinds of um you know things i think of when i think of Solantis. uh car company is not one of them so there's obviously this isn't a brand there won't be any Solantis badged vehicles it's just instead of me saying fca as a greater company now it's going to be Solantis. Um, once this merger is done with Peugeot. I'll probably continue to just call it FCA because it's just easier. Um, but yeah, interesting name there. That'll take some getting used to for sure. Now, on to some sports car news here. Mercedes-AMG has revealed the GT Black Series. And it's the ultimate track-ready version of the AMG GT and gets lots of unique stuff. The biggest thing here is that it has the 4-liter twin-turbo V8, but it's been totally reworked. So now it has a flat-plane crankshaft. That's a huge change. They say for better response and power. There's also new cams, bigger turbos, intercoolers, and a racier exhaust. <laughs> We'll have to wait to hear it actually you know, on video in a normal setting and stuff. Uh, but Shmi150 did do a walk around of it and he was actually in the debut video 
for the official AMG commercial for this car, which is super cool. Uh, I'll link it above if you want to go watch it. It's so awesome to see a YouTuber that is now in a car commercial for uh, one of the cars they're really passionate about. That is so cool. Um, so anyway, that's awesome. Uh, but back to the car, the revised engine does 720 horsepower now, 590 pound-feet of torque, um, and that horsepower rating makes it officially the highest horsepower AMG V8 they've ever made. Um, which is an awesome way to go out if the rumors are correct about them getting rid of V8s in the future. Um, anyway, the 0 to 60 is 3.1 seconds for this car. Top speed is 202 miles an hour. The transmission is still the 7 speed dual clutch, but it's been beefed up to handle the extra power and puts it all through the rear wheels, of course. There's also tons of carbon fiber to keep keep things light and strong. The drive shaft and torque tube are made of it, as is all the aero, which looks heavily inspired by a Viper ACR, in my opinion, with things like this huge rear wing that has an active flap. There's a manually adjustable front lip. You have these vents uh, in the fenders there to cool off the engine better. The roof and the hatch are also carbon fiber. The suspension is impressive as well, of course, with electronically adjustable coilovers, along with manually adjustable suspension components for camber and a bunch of other stuff, sway bars, all that. The tires are basically race tires. Uh, they're running massive Michelin Pilot Sport Cup 2 RMO tires. Um, and there's a soft tire and a hard tire you can buy, so it depends on um, what type of track driving you're doing. I mean, it is super track focused. The brakes are carbon ceramic, of course, and there's no pricing yet, but it's gonna be well over $200,000, which is what the AMG GTR already went for. So it's gonna be very expensive, but it sounds pretty insane. And they didn't announce any kind of limited run as far as how many they're building or anything. So we'll have to see about that. But anyway, this is gonna be going on sale early next year. So cool to see that. Porsche has revealed the standard 911 Turbo this week after already revealing the Turbo S a while back. And so this one does 572 horsepower, 553 pound-feet of torque, which is 68 less horsepower than the Turbo S and 36 less pound-feet of torque. But it is about 30 more than the old Turbo, so there's still definitely some progress being made here. And performance is barely any slower than the Turbo S. 0-60 to 60 is still 2.7 seconds still, meaning it's going to smoke that crazy AMG in a drag race, um, just in a normal ho-hum 911 Turbo, which is, it just shows how crazy these things are. Um, and that 2.7 second time, Time, by the way is only 0.1 seconds slower than a turbo s i don't know why you'd spend all the extra money on a turbo s to just have a 0.1 second faster zero to 60. seems like you know the turbo s is only for people who must have the absolute top thing everyone else who's you know thinking with their brain as far as how they buy these things if you're using it in the real world there's no point in getting the turbo s in my opinion Anyway, other things here, top speed does drop seven miles per hour to 198 miles per hour. Terrible. You're under 200 miles per hour for your top speed. What are you gonna do? Um, it also gets standard rear wheel steering, Porsche active suspension management, and the sport chrono package. There's still various packages you can add on as well to make it sportier, or more luxurious, depending on you know whatever you wanna do. You can delete the rear seats, all that kind of stuff if you want. The pricing starts about $30,000 less than a Turbo S2 at $172,150 for the coupe, and $184,950 for the convertible. Seems like a much better deal. Save that $30,000 for I don't know anything else. It'd probably be a better you know, buy than to spend 30 grand more for 0.1 second faster, zero to 60. Um, anyway, ordering is opening now with delivery starting early next year. And uh, so that now rounds out all the versions of the 911 now for the regular uh, 911 that we've seen. So please bring on the GT3 version soon. I can't wait to see how amazing they make the next GT3. I'm looking forward to that. But anyway, interesting to see that 911 Turbo. And now back to some affordable stuff here. So we have a few reveals from Toyota this week. First, they revealed the 2021 Corolla Apex Edition. Sadly, this isn't the faster one, though. It just gets a track tune suspension that lowers the car 0.6 inches, along with optional summer tires on lighter 18-inch wheels. It has uh, sportier power steering, a catback exhaust, and there's also a sportier look, of course. Um, and so, yeah, it's not as awesome as you know the fast version we're all hoping for. That's still coming. Hopefully, the GR version comes, you know, sometime. We'll have to wait and see. But this Apex Edition, they're only making six. 6,000 of these and for some bizarre reason only 120 of them will be built with the manual so the rest are going to have the CVT and again the CVT the Toyota uses in the Corolla is one of the better CVTs out there but still this thing's called the Apex Edition why do you think anyone buying an Apex Edition thing that's supposed to be auto-crossed and stuff is going to want an automatic? I feel like most people that are interested in this are going to want a manual. I could be wrong, but at least make it a 50-50 split and make 3,000 with a manual, 3,000 with an auto. Doing only 120 of these with a manual 
good grief. Like, why even bother doing it with a manual at that point? That is such a small percentage. Um, anyway, um, they also said that it wasn't sporty enough to warrant the TRD badge, which is why it's not a TRD Corolla like you see with the Camry and Avalon. Um, we'll see if they do do a TRD version of the Corolla down the road or if that's what they plan on calling the GR version or what. We'll have to wait and see. Um, and that's interesting that they made that choice as well because it does kind of sound like a TRD formula with a cat pack exhaust, retuned suspension, sportier wheels and tires, a little bit of a sportier look. That is basically the TRD recipe in my opinion, but I guess it's not to them. Anyway, an interesting vehicle nonetheless. Also for 2021, all Corollas now get Android Auto finally, along with the Apple CarPlay integration. And you get rear side airbags as well now on the 2021 Corollas. Uh, they have the side curtain already. I think it's just now there's a thorax type thing, I guess, for the back. I don't know, but um, interesting to see that. Uh, I think 21 Corollas they're saying are arriving now, but the Apex Edition won't be arriving until the fall. Um, but you better get in line now if you want one of those one of 120 manual Apex Corollas, um, but I'd probably recommend just waiting for the actual faster Corolla, hopefully coming here in the next year or two. We'll have to wait and see. Also though, Toyota revealed a light refresh for the 2021 Camry this week. Um, the bumpers are new, but it's hard for me to even tell a difference, but they say they're new, so I take the word for it. Uh, the bigger difference here is on the inside though now, where they have the same Toyota touchscreen as all the other new Toyotas, uh, which now uh, maxes out at a nine inch screen, and you can still get a seven inch screen if you go for a cheaper trim um but uh you know there's an improvement over the eight inch screen you used to get on top camrys um they also all now do android auto and apple carplay otherwise it's the same inside too aside from new trim upholstery um on the xle and uh one bigger change though is you can now get this xse hybrid trim which is a combination that was previously unavailable before which is you had to get you know some of the more mundane versions with the hybrid so now to get in the sportiest xse trim is kind of cool uh the base l trim is also gone now for 2021 so that's another change there's also a couple new colors and this is also going to be the first toyota to get the new safety sense 2.5 plus system um, which they say uh, improves the pre-collision assist and the pedestrian detection systems to be able to better recognize dangerous situations and i guess they have a wider field of view than they used to before so that's good they also added that the trd camry isn't going to have any exterior changes that goes through unchanged i think it might get the new center screen there on the inside, but I think that's it. Otherwise, the Camry TRDs, they're staying the same. They say they're very happy with the response to the TRD Camry, um, and so that's something they're planning on continuing for sure because they loved how much people were buying those uh, here in the past year. So that's great. Um, and uh, yeah, but no pricing yet for those new Camrys. Nissan has also revealed the 2022 Aria electric crossover. And so it looks very futuristic, just like the concept, which is impressive. I mean, it is almost identical to the concept aside from the wheels and um, like the side mirrors and the door handles. I think everything else is like identical. Even the interior looks pretty close to the concept car. You get dual 12.3 inch displays, a color heads up display. There's capacitive touch buttons hidden under this faux wood, which really looks concepty. I mean, you, they actually disappear when you turn the car off. That is really cool, honestly. Another cool touch is all the climate control hardware is under the hood. So the area below the dashboard is wide open, like a car from the 50s. I mean, it's been decades since there was a car that had nothing under the dashboard there. That is impressive and uh, help give you an airy feel. They say there's like a fold out tray you can have there and uh, one or two other things. So that's cool. Other cool things, there's a wraparound ambient lighting uh, setup, which looks pretty cool. There's wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. And the car also is available to have over the air updates. And as far as mechanicals go, there's gonna be two different versions. One is a single motor version that is uniquely uh, having the motor in the front. A lot of these other single motor electric vehicles have the motor in the back and they're all rear wheel drive. This is in the front and they said because they wanted people to feel familiar with the front wheel drive driving dynamics they're used to in crossovers and that's why they put it in the front. I think that's a really smart move honestly um, for this market of uh, buyer. Anyway that uh, low base version does 215 horsepower and 221 pound feet of torque which should be plenty especially since it's instant with the electric punch. There's also an all wheel drive dual motor system that does 389 horsepower and 443 pound feet of torque so that's the hot rod version uh the base battery is going to be a 63 kilowatt hour battery um and then the upgraded one is an 87 kilowatt hour battery and that's the actual usable battery i believe that top battery is actually 90 kilowatts but then they drop it down to 87 for what's actually usable so you don't kill the battery with a 100 percent charging and stuff um they claim the front wheel drive version with the upgraded battery can do 300 miles on the epa test 
which is very impressive if they can hit that. That would be higher than what uh, I think Ford's going to be able to get with the Mach-E here. Um, it'll also use the second-gen version of the ProPilot Assist um, software so that you have hands-free driving if you pay for that option and as a, a driver monitoring system, much like Cadillac Super Cruise, in order to do that safely. Um, and so that's great that they've you know implemented that. But like I said, this is a 2022 model year vehicle, which means it's not going to be going on sale, they're saying, until late 2021. So we got, you know, like a year and a half or so before these things are going to start showing up on the streets. Uh, but the pricing sounds pretty reasonable. It didn't get too exact, but um, it, it seems like the pricing is going to be starting around $40,000 or so for that base trim. So yes, it's a good chunk more expensive than a Leaf or something like that, but this is way cooler than a Leaf, um, more powerful than a Leaf, all that kind of stuff. And um, I think this should do really well for Nissan. I hope it does. Um, and so anyway, cool to see that. Along with the Aria though, Nissan officially uh, unveiled their new logo here, which uh, is meant to signal the transformation of the company and the new day for Nissan is what they're saying. And I think it actually is a really nice new logo. I like the way they did that. It's more modern, also a little bit retro at the same time. I think it's really cool. Uh, it's going to be on all the new models they're saying coming from now on. So this is the Nissan badge you'll get on the new Frontier, the new Z. All those are going to have this new badge. Although strangely, I don't think the Rogue has it, even though that's a 2021 model. But anyway, um, cool to see that little change. And some other electrified news. Maserati this week has revealed the Ghibli Hybrid, but it's only for Europe for now. Uh, they told Autoblog that their research suggested the American market prefers other kinds of engines. <laughs> I think mostly it's just the hurdle of getting a Maserati and then only having a two liter four cylinder engine in it. That's the holdup because yeah, these are gonna be running um, a turbo uh, two liter four cylinder engine. It replaces the diesel version in Europe and that's kind of the angle there for those of you in Europe. Um, and so it's combined with a 48 volt system and an e-booster electric supercharger type setup that ends up doing a pretty impressive 330 horsepower and 332 pound-feet of torque um, still runs a 5.7 seconds 0 to 60 and uses a normal 8-speed automatic still and they told Autoblog they considered doing a plug-in hybrid version but they didn't want to hurt the fun to drive character um, that's important for Maserati and I guess adding batteries would uh, weigh it down too much um, they also did add that it still sounds good they said they are really proud of the fact that they didn't do any electronic tricks to make it sound good. They said they just modified the exhaust and added in resonators to make it sound sweet. So I'm excited to kind of hear how that sounds. It also gets a unique grille, blue accents, and the fender vents and the badges. There's also some restyled taillights. The interior also gets new gauges and a new 10.1 inch Android based infotainment system that still runs both Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. And we should be seeing at least those interior improvements here on the other Maseratis here coming for the 2021 model year. We'll have to wait and see on that but uh, at least this hybrid for now is only for Europe. Uh, but those of you in Europe, if you're interested in getting one, production is going to be starting in September. So cool to see that. And Hyundai has a new trim here for the Palisade for the 2021 model year. So only one year on the market and they already have a new version. It's called the Calligraphy trim. I think they're kind of going after the autobiography trims from Land Rover and stuff. Um, and so this is the new top trim here for 2021. Uh, it goes above the limited and it gets this new triangular dot grille setup, which looks kind of cool. It also gets exclusive 20 inch wheels that are uh, pretty interesting looking. It also gets some lower door trim, a longer third brake light and even unique taillights they're saying. Although I can't tell any difference in the taillights between that and the regular Palisade, but they say they're different. Inside, it gets quilted leather door panels and seats, which I believe you also got in the Limited, because I remember reviewing them with the quilted um, seats and stuff, but I think this is a more defined quilting. Uh, it seems a little bit of a larger quilt pattern than on the uh, Limited. There's also a perforated leather steering wheel now and a suede-style headliner and a few other little uh, improvements on the inside there. Uh, but anyway, pricing is going to be starting at $48,890 for that trim, which is only... $925 more than a limited all-wheel drive. Uh, so, you know, you're not paying much more. And this uh, calligraphy trim comes standard with all-wheel drive as well. So, you know, for only less than a thousand bucks more to get the nicer grill and stuff, I think it's probably worth it. And uh, cool, they're offering that. The last news story this week, though, is an interesting one here. It's a report about the future of the Supra. Uh, and this is reported by Best Car Magazine in Japan that was then translated by Motor One. And so the report claims that in 2023, BMW will let Toyota use the S58 twin turbo 3 liter straight six in the Supra. And so this is the same engine that's currently being used in the brand new M3 and M4, and also in the X3M and X4M that motor's already in use. And they claim that uh, the Supra's chief engineer is the one that gave them this information, by the way. Even with that being said, take this with a grain of salt, because this some of this stuff, it kind of makes sense, but also it seems a little iffy. So 
Um, first, um, you know, he's uh, the, apparently the chief engineer is the one who convinced BMW to let them use it. And the justifications seem to be threefold from um, what they're reporting here. First, by 2023, it's going to be an older engine at that point, and BMW will probably have already used it in all their cars, and it'll be kind of like the you know B58 motor is now, where you know it was the hot thing five years ago. And now it's like, eh, all right, we'll give it to the Supra. It seems like Toyota's getting all the hand-me-downs, and at that point, the S58 would kind of be a hand-me-down motor, and so um, that kind of makes sense there. The next um, supporting thing is supposedly the agreement requires that it be paired up with the seven speed M dual clutch transmission, which is the transmission from the old M3 here um, that is now getting scrapped for the ZF8 speed in the new M3. Um, so, you know, the ZF8 speed BMW M thinks is superior and it's smoother and stuff. And so I know a lot of people are upset about the lack of a dual clutch in the new M3. Um, so maybe this would appeal to those people, but in BMW's eyes, this is a downgrade transmission wise. So again, it kind of handicaps that S58 motor in their opinion. And so is another reason why, you know, they, um, We'll let them use it supposedly. Lastly, this is going to be an ultra rare version of the Supra. This is, I guess, they're saying this would be in the GRMN version or whatever. Um, and they're saying that only 200 units would be made. And if they're making that few, I doubt we even get in the states. Um, if we do, there's going to be a dozen, and they'll probably be 150 grand by the time you're done with dealer markups and stuff. Um, I'm not sure. That really sounds sketchy because. Why even go to the bother of doing all this stuff and re-engineering everything to work with that engine and stuff if you're only making 200 of them? Even if you price them at insane prices, is it worth it? I don't know. That's the biggest thing that makes it iffy. I mean, I usually hate whenever they do limited production of anything, but this is super limited production, so I don't know. But that's the cold water here on the news story that uh, gives you, brings you back to reality here. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, I mean, it would be awesome to see a Super coming from the factory with either 473 horsepower or 503 horsepower, depending on which tune of that engine BMW lets them have, um, whether it's the regular one or the competition engine. Um, and lastly, for a little bit more bad news, this report also says they're confident that the Super is going to get killed off by 2025 uh, because Toyota's plan is to have an electrified version of every model by 2025, and they don't want to develop a hybrid Super because of the compromises required, supposedly. So that raises another domino effect of questions in my mind, at least. If they do stick to this, and that's the reason for killing off the Super is you don't want to have a hybrid thing, what are they going to do about the next gen 86 and BRZ? They confirm they, those vehicles are coming, and unless it's only going to have a four year run before 2025, you know, they're supposed to be coming next year. You only get in, you know, three or four model years and you're done. It doesn't seem like it's worth, um, you know, doing a next gen version of these models unless it's just a heavily reworked version of the current BRZ and 86. Um, but so expect if they do stick to that, then that means the 86 and the BRZ are going to have um, some type of hybrid component either when they launch in 2021 next year or for their maybe their mid-cycle refresh in 2025 they'll add that in I don't know but you know that vehicle in particular it's all about light low weight um, you know if smooth handling and you know everything being so uncompromised I don't even want to add a turbo to it because that would you know, ruin the handling so I mean putting a battery in that would really ruin it in their mind so how they're going to hybridize that and think that that's not compromised but then say it's a compromise to put it in a super which is you know 400 pounds heavier or whatever that seems kind of strange to me you know again i'm sure there's more stuff behind the scenes that makes it make sense i don't know we'll have to wait and see again this is all rumors and stuff so that's why i'm still taking this with a grain of salt because it doesn't seem to add up 100 percent in my mind i could see the super getting killed off by 2025 just because at that point you know you've given it a you know a five-year run that's a little short for a model but you know not the shortest uh especially if people aren't buying tons of them so i could see that but you know the whole hybrid justification i don't buy because of, again the 86 and the brz so anyway that's the report there. Again, we'll see what happens and you know what they actually end up doing, but an interesting report nonetheless and something to think about. And that was going to be the end of the weekly update, but then uh, today on Friday here, Honda dropped a bomb on us enthusiasts uh, with some pretty bumming news. So first off, they're killing off a couple different models. They're killing off the fit here in the States. It's not going to be returning with the next gen version and this current version is uh, on its way out and uh, it will not have a replacement. They say they're just going to boost production of the HRV instead, um, which is really a bummer because uh, a lot of people really enjoyed the fit. Uh, but some even more disappointing news is first, they're killing off the manual transmission version of the Honda Accord. There's going to be a refresh for the Accord here for 2021. 
And with that refresh, the manual transmission is going to go away. They said that the manual only accounted for 2% of Accord sales. No one bought them. Um, and they said that uh, they actually had such little demand that they quit building the manual back in December of 2019 and never resumed production. And they're just now running out of inventory of those manuals. I think there's like 15 or 20 left in the country. Um, so that's a huge bummer because I really enjoyed the manual in the Accord, in the Accord, you know, sedan and the 1.5T. And I heard the 2.0T version was also pretty awesome as well. So that's a bummer. Uh, but even more upsetting news from Honda is that uh, they're going to be killing off the Civic Coupe. They said that uh, it is not returning. And so literally the SI Coupe I just reviewed this week and was like, oh, I'm so glad that Honda has kept around the Coupe. Um, that turns out to have aged poorly because they are now getting rid of the Coupe for all Civics here. Um, that will not be coming back uh, for the next gen version, which they did say the next gen Civic is coming next spring as a 2022 model year vehicle. Um, so that is something to you know look out for. But in the meantime, they did say they're also killing off the Civic Si just for this year to transition to the new gen version. So the Si will be back, but it sounds like the Coupe will not be back. They said the Coupe started out being about 16% of sales when they launched this generation Civic and has now dropped to 6%. So lots of people uh, don't have any interest in the Coupe anymore. They did say the hatchback though has grown a lot with its demand and now it makes up 24% of Civic sales. And so they're saying that now the hatchback will be the sportier variant of the Civic to replace uh, the Coupe as far as the positioning there. And they said that the next gen version of the hatchback Civic will be built here in the States, which means it could potentially be on the table for an SI version of the hatch now, um, which would be pretty awesome if they at least have that as a consolation prize for getting rid of the uh, Civic SI Coupe, which has been a sport compact staple for decades. Um, it's kind of the end of an era because that is officially, I think, the last two-door coupe sport compact um and uh they were just so legendary you know in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and uh now that uh generation and that era has come to an end and i'm really kind of sad about that honestly uh, and if you can snap one up um the you know 2020 civic si coupe i just reviewed was a fantastic car well worth you know owning aside from a couple little flaws which i think could be fixed um but yeah really a shame uh so but just had to get that news in here because i know many of you would be seeing that and commenting about that so i wanted to address that here but yeah sorry to be the bearer of bad news here on a friday afternoon but anyway, that's it for all the news this week, guys. So thank you guys very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts on all this stuff in the comments below. Please continue to stay safe and healthy, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care.